challenge you to uh, spend a few hours with us on tours around the United States. So you will be uh, glad to see you all here. My name is Ronnie Schrock. I'm the director of Ivy, and uh, we're really pleased tonight to have the panel on stage. I think it's going to be a, a fantastic discussion around a technology that is uh, past the emerging stage. It's, it's, it's changing the way we think about the possibilities of so many things. I know I, for one, am really happy Myself. And um, to uh, just say a few words uh, about the panel, um, Amy Whitaker is a writer, artist, and teacher working at the intersection of creativity, business, and everyday life. Um, Amy is also the author of Museum Legs and the 2013 recipient of the Lower Manhattan Cultural Council's Sarah Redone Writing Award. Uh, I'm going to leave it at that and turn it over to the panel to, <laughs> to uh, introduce uh, themselves and we have having this informal conversations here, so we want to open it up to uh, all of you in the audience uh, at some point uh, to ask any questions as well. So, thank you very much. Uh, great, thank you, Brian. But I'll pass this microphone over in just a second. I'm, or am I double? Am I mic? Yeah, you can hear me. Okay. Um, first of all, a huge thanks to Roddy, Erica, Laura, and the rest of the My name is Sean Mosspoltz. Uh, I'm from California, but I've lived in um, Asia. I lived in Taiwan for about 12 years. Um, this is my second company there. First one was a disaster. Hopefully the second one's not. Um, uh, I am um, working specifically on what it means to own something digital, um, what it means to um, own the data that people are generating all day long, whether that data is um, software or media or even like things that are coming out of your Fitbit. Um, how uh, like individuals should look at that from a perspective of their personal property versus um, licensing versus all of these kind of things that, that, um, that have been in the news a lot lately, like Apple and the FBI, these kind of things when the banks get hacked and medical records get stolen. So we're sort of trying to figure out if there's a better way to handle digital things. 
My name is Craig Baker. Um, I'm an intellectual property and licensing lawyer, and about half of what I do is technology, and the other half is content-based uh, uh, licensing and, and IP. And so a lot of what I do is in the intersection between those two. So it's it's uh, music and movies and um, and art all in this sort of digital uh, landscape and sort of all of the new platforms and distributions and new ownership models, those are all things that we're coping with on a really everyday basis. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm genuinely excited to just get to have a conversation about all these ideas and I just wanna offer um, a, a tiny bit about my own background and framing. Um, and before I do that, can I just open it up? Are there, on this topic of the digital life of ownership and art, are there particular questions or circumstance that drove people to the topic that you would like to share, that you would like to have in the room before the Q&A? Or would you like us to keep going? Anyone? Bueller? Well, yeah. I was Mm -hmm. And it's really easy and it's cheap and it's really easy to kill people. So I, I heard rumors that maybe there is a way of using um, Bitcoin technology to guarantee all mm -hmm. Maybe something like that? Yeah, great. Um, so what, uh, the idea of using Bitcoin blockchain technology to guarantee authenticity. Other ideas that people would like to be sure to discuss? Yeah. Yeah, the share and share like ethos. Yeah, I think that um, for me, ownership and generosity are flip sides, that there's something about ownership that makes giving things and sharing things uh, clearer. So that's an interesting theme as well. Anything else before we, yeah. Appropriation. Yeah, I'm like over to you, Craig. Um, yes, definitely. Okay, these are so yeah, sharing, borrowing, um, yeah, all of the uh, avoiding stealing. <laughs> um, these are all great topics. So, um, Roddy very kindly introduced me just very briefly. The market characteristic of my background is that I have an MBA and an MFA in painting, and so these questions about how business or finance and ownership and law and creative work writ large fit together are really interesting to me. And a couple of years ago, I wrote a paper on ownership and art working with a couple of IBM people, or Michael Mandeberg and then Caroline Woolard and some other people. And so I've taken a great interest in that. Um, in the spirit of having lawyers on the panel, let me just say my, um, I'm, I'm an advisor to Bitmark, uh, Sean's company, and Kevin, who's not yet here, was on the selection committee for a job I just took at NYU that starts in September. So. I'm conflicted in all ways, which is like being not, not conflicted. Um, and I also just want to say a special thanks. These guys are in from really far away. So I would like this to be like as if I were opening like really great Italian red wine and serving pasta to all of us. Like I genuinely would like to have a conversation about ideas with these lovely, amazing people and all of you. Um, so um, let me just like start us off a little bit, just sort of framing and then kind of volley the ball here. So we're talking about a number of things that are particularly timely, and we're talking about the life of digital art with regard to ownership um, right now, which is a moment when these large-scale tech platforms are in their ascendancy, and intellectual property is very complicated by you know, self-creation, YouTube, democratization of content. And so, I mean, I think in a way this is like a dream team of people, especially once Kevin arrives, or if we represent what Kevin does otherwise. Um, I work at the New Museum Incubator, so I'm familiar with his company. Do you all know Monograph? Uh, Kevin's, so, so what I would like to do is um, put Sean on the spot, because Kevin isn't here yet, and uh, talk about um, the, the companies, Monograph and Bitmark, as case studies in um, ways to possibly, to your question, I don't know your name. Um, Les. Les? To Les's question about uh, ownership and the blockchain, I think um, Kevin and Sean, their companies are trying to solve for these questions in different and complementary ways. So um, Bitmark is an ownership platform and Monograph is specifically a licensing platform. So maybe, Sean, if you wanna talk a little bit in relation to what Les was sure. saying, like how, how are you trying to deal with these kind of authenticity, uh, yeah. scarcity questions? Yeah, so um, 
like authenticity and scarcity um, is something that's really, really interesting. And can you all hear? Sorry. Can you, do you want me to use the microphone? Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, it is on. It's on. Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, so, uh, how can something be digital and scarce? Is sort of a fascinating question in and of itself. But let's focus first on authenticity. That was your first question. And so, um, uh, for centuries, thousands of years, whatever, um, somebody had to say something was authentic. And um, how somebody says that, how that's recorded, um, how that's preserved through time um, is something that has traditionally required institutions, uh, governments, um, patent records, um, you know, housing deeds, all of these sorts of instruments. And um, the invention, if you will, of Bitcoin is a way to, um, to arrive at consensus of um, the state. So for this discussion, arrive at consensus of who owns what, um, to arrive at consensus of is something authentic or not. Um, if I was to send money to you, um, normally there's banks that would deduct money from my bank account, put it into your account, keep track of those ledgers on both sides, um, make sure that I don't get to keep the money and spend it at the same time. Um, and the invention of Bitcoin is uh, how do you solve specifically this double spend issue? How do I stop spending the same Bitcoin to two people? And then how do you know that that Bitcoin is uh, in fact a genuine Bitcoin? And most importantly, how do you do it without a central authority, without a counterparty? Um, that was thought to be uh, an unsolvable problem in computer science and somebody solved it. We don't know who solved it. Um, definitely not Craig Wright, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, one digression. Um, Satoshi was without a doubt a genius and the way the genius would show the world that he or she was the creator of Bitcoin would be very simple and the thing that Craig Wright tried to do is unbelievably complicated and that's just, I mean you can read it and there's all kinds of factual errors but um, so so the, what's fascinating now is that um, for the first time in history there's actually a way to talk about authenticity, um, to talk about scarcity of something digital and to not have to require a, a central authority. So, so the idea is that you could, you could recreate digital scarcity using encryption, that you, you, if you put work online, how, how would this work in practice? Yeah, so, um, so there's the, um, the part about authenticity, so I created this, um, and then there's the part about protection, which can come later, and that's, that's the encryption side. Um, and so like, I want to give you something, and only you, and only you could see it. Um, and then also I want to record that ownership change or I want to record that, that transfer. And so, um, uh, you know, whenever anybody tells you blockchain, you can just think of um, a really interesting ledger of keeping track of who has what without requiring a counterparty. So, so that's, that's the radical idea is that um, if I have a property uh, you know, for thousands of years, whenever I want to change the ownership of that property, it's gonna require a government or some institution. Um, and now you can transfer the ownership of something peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer. Yeah. So there are these inter really interesting levers, and it, we're all going to take turns playing the role of Kevin. I'm going to ask you licensing questions on his behalf, Craig. But I, these, these, these levers of ownership and licensing, which are ways of using technology and the blockchain specifically to um, to manage the way that creative people's work is used and not stolen or shared with clarity uh, and good boundaries. And I, I'm wondering, um, Craig, and then also can you, if you can comment a little bit on um, licensing and what's happening kind of in the legal practice around licensing, because in broad strokes, uh, I think what Bitmark is doing is creating digital scarcity through ownership. So essentially creating an addition in the artistic sense for, for works of art, among, among other things that the company is doing. And Monograph is using um, the blockchain in order to allow licensing, kind of controlled and, and um, credited licensing. And I'm just wondering if you can kind of talk a little bit about your, your work in that area, since you're a licensing expert, again, among other things. Um, so, I mean, it's kind of interesting. If you think back and you think about art in an analog world, art originally was just, you, you, with your sweat equity, you could only create one thing. Um, and then as technology has come along, it's made it, it, it's become easier and easier, whether it's printmaking or photography or something, where suddenly technology is facilitating the ease in creating more than one. And so you have these different models of, of value based on whether or not you're the original artist's print or whether you have, you know, a, a, a limited um, sign, you know, whether the signature, which, which <coughs> One of the things that technology is also that 
Um, <laughs> and you don't really have any other sort of a short of a lawsuit, which most people don't necessarily want to go through. There, there isn't necessarily that, that consequence. The exciting thing now um, in the licensing space is how do you um, both create the authenticity, um, also then facilitate simplicity in the licensing schema. And we're really at the very, very front edge of this notion of sort of automating licensing where um, maybe your browser will have a certain set of settings with respect to um, the kind of content you're willing to share, the kind of data you're willing to share by yourself, and they'll do a handshake. Um, if anybody has ad blockers on their browsers and if you've landed on like Forbes magazine or uh, somebody else who's, who's new, they wired, I think, we land and then they, they put a wall and they said, you've got an ad blocker, we're not going to let you look at our content because you have an ad blocker. We're going to start to see more and more of these kinds of, of schema to try and sort of limit the way that, that licensing is happening. And I think that we'll see artists adopt that to sort of manage their, their art that, that's now available. Mm -hmm. And just building on that for a second, are there like particular innovations that you've seen in legal practice around licensing? That certainly sounds like one, but are there things you've kind of noticed cropping up? Um, I have noticed them cropping up really just over the last 12 months where we've seen, I mean, we've seen software in the marketplace that are designed to automate the preparation of licenses, um, to basically try and, and bring the cost down and simplify for, for lawyers, but not necessarily to, to avoid lawyers and to disrupt the legal market <laughs> in that licensing scheme. We're starting to see in the last 12 months this notion of, of automating that negotiating process, automating the, the sort of licensing process. I mean, we have seen um, um, innovation. Um, you have it actually right there on the locker, right? Which is, um, all of you um, may not have even noticed it, which makes me questionable about whether it's enforceable, but you all have agreed to have your photo taken, and that will be used for promotional use. Um, that is a way that is, is, you know, we have terms and conditions. Um, many of you, any of you who are surfing right now are actually entering into contracts automatically, whether you, whether you know or not. Um, we have electronic all basically establish these new ways of, of entering into contracts. And so we've seen that. But in terms of like this whole disruptive, um, we're going to to bypass um, the legal process as a, and, and impose a technological process as opposed to using technology to facilitate the traditional process. That's very good. And that's right. part of the line. Right, right. And I think this is very interesting just to put a pin in it uh, for a little later, the, this idea of um, of, of part of modern life being the um, incredibly closely held expertise uh, that affects so many different people. So legal expertise, technological expertise, um, many forms of consenting to things that I, as a generalist lay person, might not know that I'm consenting to in a legal sense, and <coughs> might um, want to understand, feel a responsibility to understand in a technological sense. Um, so on the ownership side, um, and. We'll just share the microphones. On the ownership side, um, what are the things that you're seeing happening specifically around technology and digital companies? Well, I mean, I would just say that where, you know, a lot of, um, I mean, a, a lot of investment is happening. You're, you're just seeing a lot of platforms. Like uh, the internet makes it possible to, to, to match buyers and sellers on a lot of different le levels and that means in the world of licensing as well right and so you can find whereas before you may have had a limited audience in terms of you know uh, uh, you know just who lives in your neighborhood or who you know who you know or all those things now you've got you've got people you know just you can find massive audiences and where, where a lot of businesses are, are, are getting funded is is um, is in the idea of bringing platforms together and, and, and getting to Craig's point of making licensing easier and making um, uh, a, a centralized place where you can go and you can f somebody will act as a middleman to facilitate that on a digital level, making it effectively seamless um, relative to, to, to ownership and and licensing or renting that um, that those rights. Right. Right. In platforms to manage this for Creative Commons, which just Larry Lessig said here. Yeah, it'll 
Right. <laughs> uh, yeah. But, uh, but that, the, the, the big sort of technological addition of Creative Commons was the fact that you would put this bug on your content and then you could search against it as opposed to just carrying an open source license on it, which is what the old software um, open source movement had. Oh, so people were putting a bug on their Creative Commons license so they could search for the bug and then they would send the Bobby style cease and desist letter at that no, point? No, or? no. So, so Creative Commons is a mechanism where you choose one of six licenses um, that, defi that is a defined license. And just like the open source licenses, uh, it was to simplify the licensing process because you knew. So if, if I say to uh, somebody in the, the software development industry that this, this is open source software, this is a library license known as a BSD license, everybody knows that's a Berkeley license and what that means. Um, and so you know sort of basically what the rights are. And Creative Commons did that for content. But the thing that was so um, interesting about the Creative Commons piece was that they, if you had creative content and you, you had it digitally, is that you would put a little marker on it that says, I'm offering this for Creative Commons. And when you could then get into a search engine and search only for Creative Commons content, so that you could therefore figure out what content you could use. And you didn't oh, have to I see. sort through Oh, it. right. I, I yeah. was thinking that the Not creator was using it from a pleasing no, standpoint. No. Right, yeah. of course, of course. It's like knowing it's quasi-public domain. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, so um, one of the things we're talking about is kind of licensing as, as allowing people to, in a certain way, assert ownership, the way we're talking about it. It's licensing is stemming from ownership, that there has to be um, a clear assignment of property rights to the creator so that they can license it, right? Um, and what I'm finding really interesting is that both licensing and ownership seem to work from the point of view of the creator, but I feel like um, from the point of view of the user, the person who's receiving it, they function in very different ways. And I'm just wondering, um, Sean, I know this is kind of part of what you're engaged in. If, yeah. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll say a few sentences about um, this part, because actually, um, I think probably one of the single worst decisions that Congress made um, was in the 70s when they decided to grant uh, copyright to um, the object code of software. So I don't know if you guys know the difference. You have source codes and you have object codes. And in the traditional world, you had um, uh, the, they used to like to describe it in terms of um, the, uh, the blueprint for a bridge and the bridge itself. So you can get copyright for the blueprint. You cannot get copyright for the bridge. Okay. And when things went digital, um, it's a very long story why they did this, but um, they actually gave copyright to the bridge. And so when you buy music or when you buy something from Kindle or when you buy photography from some website, you're actually not buying it. You're getting a license to access it. And the license is revocable. It's, um, there, there's all kinds of like stipulations that go along with it. And so um, what, um, what I was wondering would be, okay, could you make it to where you could actually own it? Like you could actually make it something that you can own and, and access doesn't depend upon a third party. Like if you look sort of at the history of, of personal property, um, you know, your ability to get in your car never depended upon if Toyota said you could or not. Um, your ability to listen to your music now depends entirely on whether Apple or Spotify, whoever thinks you can use it or not. And so you end up with these situations where um, 10 years from now, 50 years from now, 100 years from now, can you or can you not access this digital object depends upon um, is there a corporation who still thinks it's worth supporting that. So this, this kind of fits two questions here. So um, the part about the open source, uh, I think you absolutely have to demand that any of these core technologies that get developed that are managing either licensing or ownership, it has to be open source. Um, I think if it's not, it's sort of like uh, if you're building a home um, and the engineer, the civil engineer says, okay, well, I'm gonna put beams here, there, 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 but you can't see them. Like, you're not gonna be able to go inspect that. Right? Like, we would never tolerate this like, in the real world. That would just be ludicrous. No builder would ever do that. But in the digital world, we do that all the time. We use software that we have no idea what's going on. We have no idea how that's working. And so I think the open source part is not dead at all. Um, I think there's nothing incompatible with something like Bitcoin that enforces digital scarcity through some kind of consensus. And um, Wikipedia that is also um, uh, developing um, like a whole corpus of knowledge also through consensus, right? Or um, Linux, where you have developers who are contributing where everybody can see. I think these ideas are actually sort of different sides of the same coin. 
So this notion of um, being able to own a digital thing, um, nothing wrong with licensing. I'm, I'm not bagging on licensing. It's just uh, I think you should always have an alternative, like renting and owning. I think these go together. It's good to buy a car. It's good to rent a car. It depends on what you want. Yeah, you should see how it's all a computer. Just totally read that. Um, totally read that. Um, so, but so it's always been the case that you never owned the book that you had. So the physical book that you own, you own the the ink, you own the paper, you own the cardboard. Um, you don't own the words that are inside. It always belongs to the author. But what you've had is. Did, um, and, and convinced all of us to do is to license software rather than um, to, to own it. And the, the reason why this matters is there's something called the first sale doctrine under copyright law. And the first sale doctrine says that if you own something, you have the ability to sell it. And so that's why we have these books. Um, and why you can buy a used CD, but you can't buy a used copy of your, you know, an iTunes thing. Because in a software context, in, in a digital context, They said, um, you know what, we think this is a license. And if something is licensed and not sold, and if you go and look at any of these EULAs that you click through, there's in all caps, it says this is licensed, not sold. The reason why that language is in there is because they want to avoid the first sale doctrine. They want to make it so that you can't sell that product. And so there have been a whole series of cases um, about sort of the first sale doctrine and whether or not One of the things that we've seen in digital, which is really interesting, and um, all of you are also giving these things up, um, so long as you are members of Facebook or Twitter or any other social media platform, um, is that you can grant a license equivalent to ownership. And so if you go and read the statement of, of rights and responsibilities on Facebook, and you go and look at what the license is that you're granting to Facebook with respect to your photos, that is the exact same bucket of rights that you have as an owner. Uh, and so you've now, the only thing that you, you've up is the ability to, of, of that sort of uh, ability to hold something exclusively. So we are seeing all these really interesting shifts and changes in the way that people are thinking about um, licensing it as they go. Um, just a sidebar question. What's that conversation like in legal circles right now about terms and conditions agreements and the enforceability of contracts that most people in practice don't read? Well, you're, you're uh, so you're, too, you're, you're you're much too busy with the, the intricacies of the practice of law, but um, like in theory. So so first of all, I'm disappointed. Um, <laughs> you know what? I have a I have a um, Craig Craig. If it if it makes you feel better, I'm a writer of books, and I'm sure I'm in your same boat half okay. the time. So. Yeah. No. I mean, I just you know I know what's in there, so I know. I am I am I am. Like, I, I have, job, I'm going with my eyes open. Right? Um, so. Um, by and large, um, terms and conditions are enforceable. Um, there are um, definitely um, things at the margin um, that are unenforceable. Most of the lawsuits that we have seen, in most cases, the, the damage to an individual um, is minor. And so no one's really going to sue over a, a $4 or $5 harm. And so most of the lawsuits happen over people trying to come up with class actions around something having to do with online. We are seeing now are more and more action from the Federal Trade Commission. The Federal Trade Commission has um, asserted broader, um, uh, broader control and broader jurisdiction over things like privacy and data usage. And so we've seen cases that uh, actually now, if there's a data breach, they're going to say that that's an acceptable trade practice. Um, and then um, most importantly, we've seen the, um, Kamala Harris, the California Attorney General, um, has become very, very um, assertive with respect to um, the way that um, some of these terms and conditions should be presented. And, and so if you go and you look at, say, Google's terms and conditions now, um, you'll see this change which has happened where um, there are these short summary terms and conditions. Um, and part of this is because we look at these things on mobile now. Um, part of it is because of the, the sort of movement for simple language in these. Um, and so you will see the top sites have really changed the user interface for their terms. I would say only the top sites uh, have, been, have done this. But you will see, and you're starting to see it um, filter down. Anybody who's got um, a, you know, a, a significant risk profile because they, they you know, have an e-commerce company that may have consequences or they're dependent on, on these licenses, they will 
I mean, a lot of this, I think, has to do with uh, the feeling of depth of pockets with regard to legal risk, right? Right, but I'll, yeah, exactly. It's, it's, it's the how much legal risk do I have? So, the, so the banks um, at, at, who are doing, you know, your credit card companies and anybody who's doing um, online pay services or any of the fintech companies, they're exceptionally careful about this, and they um, they know what their obligations and rules are, and they will take the time and money uh, to do it. Um, I imagine that you know somebody who doesn't have that risk um, in terms of their online activity probably going to go and do what most people do, which is grab it from somebody else uh, that looks like them. Uh, and go, well, gee, I have a remote storage hosting company. Let me go see what Dropbox and Box have. Oh, that looks good. I think I will change that, change the names. And <laughs> um, Yay, what, intellectual property. That's what's well. It's yeah. questionable whether there's copyright because there's not a lot of creativity involved. But, um, <laughs> but there's uh, uh, you know, but that's probably six Right. It's interesting. So, I mean, one of the underlying themes, I think, is in, with regard to some of the questions in the audience beforehand, is this idea of shared use versus shared ownership. So, I think um, licensing is a form of shared use. You know, it, it turns it into kind of public good where we can all use the thing at the same time in a roughly non um, interfering way. Um, and then I think. Uh, on the, one of the ways that I was introduced to the work Sean was doing was the, the paper I was working on with Michael Mandelberg, um, just to risk the mortal sin of moderators of like talking for a bit. Um, but I, this is relevant uh, to the topic, is um, trying to understand the applications of the conversation that's happened around ownership in art, specifically with regard to resale royalties and how that might play into technology. So people are probably pretty familiar with resale royalties, this idea that artists are not fairly paid when they sell things. So again, when they're in an ownership paradigm as opposed to a licensing paradigm, and they sell a work and then they become famous and the work resells later for a very high price and they don't have any exposure to that. Whereas in a licensing world, writers who have royalties, um, it's different. And so um, realize that what you could do instead is assign equity shares. So you could have shared ownership or fractional ownership of works of art. And, um, that those those could circulate in in marketplaces. So it, it it's a other side of the seesaw. And I guess can you you work so often with people who are figuring out equity ownership schemes, who are going to companies together, who are investors. Can you just comment on this a little bit? Yeah, I, I mean, um, uh, you know, the the idea of. Um, Having an equitable interest in art, or um, is is fascinating, just because you can separate ownership amongst a, a, a number of people and try and retain um, um, uh, ret retain some value as it goes o o uh, as it makes its way through the marketplace. I think that you know, in general, though, I, I think you know, you're never. Um, Art is such, is, for some people, it has so many different meanings for so many different people. So some, for some people, it's about having it tangibly in there, and some people are making it as an investment, right? They're truly making it just to kind of put it away and wait for 10 years, and hopefully it goes up in value, and they, 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 they do that. And so, so when you have those differing um, interests, so to speak, it's hard to get everyone aligned in the same direction. And, and um, uh, you know, as you, you when you're kind of uh, unknown, you know, a relatively unknown artist, and you're you're trying to establish yourself, this is true in anything. Is that you have to give up something to kind of get something, so to speak, and you may not be able to retain the the the, the value um, uh, that um, uh, over time you have to, to 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 give up that benefit. But it is it is a fascinating idea to. Um, um, you know, to, to, to treat art w like a security, right, and have securities that are issued to people over time. Let the artist retain some some portion of that ownership as it as it travels through the system. It's it's certainly conceivable. You could have a piece of art held by a corporate entity and sell equity in that corporate entity, and everyone just owns a piece of uh, a percentage of that piece of art. That's certainly possible, and I, I think a fascinating idea for sure. Well, we've seen that in the, in the European soccer player market. Uh, oh, interesting. Where um, you will have people who um, you know, are discovered in a small town in Spain.
Spain or in Brazil or something, and they have the local team who takes them through their youth league, and then they sell them to the local sort of regional team, um, and, and they don't trade players in um, the European soccer market, they sell them. Um, and so they go up and, they, and the, the players get sold, and um, most, um, uh, most uh, particularly other than World, there are what are called sell-on rights, and you get a portion of the sell-on right to the extent that the player is sold for either more than a certain amount or a certain amount. Um, but they actually did create, they had some investors about five years ago who actually created um, securities around individual players. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's a, they have a player named Carlos Tevez uh, who was owned by Carlos Tevez and Consortium. Uh, so he was not owned <laughs> by himself anymore. Um, he was actually owned by a consortium, and so his future earnings were all these essentially part ownership that, that were um, yeah. to him. And so it, it goes to your point yeah. about sort of different... Yeah, I, I, I worked on a, uh, a guy, a young, a, a young um, guy who wanted to be a NASCAR driver. And so what he did is he, he, he contributed effectively all his IP, which was his name, his likeness, his, all, you know, his winnings into a company, for, for, for folks to invest in um, and, and, and people knew he was an up and coming driver. He would look, look like he was gonna be the next, you know, uh, Dale Earnhardt and, and everyone um, uh, put, in, put, in uh, put in capital based on not only his future earnings, but also just his licensing and all of the things that surround a NASCAR driver. So <clears throat> those kind of, um, those are very unique and, and it requires to me the right, I mean, the marketability relative to investment. It, 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 you just have, you either have to have a track record or you have to have a, um, a, a, a reputation already built in to make it marketable from an investment standpoint. But, but how is that? It's not, it's really not. It's, it's, it, yeah. You're really selling investment. Another microphone. Right, so, right. It's really not, the, the only key is that it, it really comes, in those kind of circumstances, it really comes down to the person, like the, the, the creator and a piece of art, or it comes down to the driver or the skill of one Another unique individual, whereas theoretically, you know, you can replace Steve Jobs with, you know, somebody else. But, Unless he um, <laughs> I know, I was just making sure if we happen to have another microphone. Um, oh. I, Okay, perfect. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, I, it, 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 I mean, um, but there are unique circumstances where, where a person who has um, a certain reputation or, or a certain community of people around them or angel investors that invest in people all the time. I think you mentioned I in your book and uh, uh, mentioned Harper Lee and the, 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 about somebody saying, I just want to give you money to write your book, or to take a year off and write your book, right? And the, those kind of things do happen. Um, and you can set up an entity to allow people who have supported you to theoretically, you know, um, uh, uh, to reap the benefits of that right. over time. Well, I think one of the things that's interesting is that, um, I mean, I, I love these stories. I, I want to learn more, especially about the European soccer players. Um, but I think one of the things that's interesting is that you see that happen a lot in the arts where you can make a case that someone like Damien Hirst is a brand that people buy shares in by buying one of the dot paintings, for example, and that they're relatively interchangeable. And I think one of the flip sides to the investment piece is the risk management piece. Sean, I remember you were telling me a story about um, the uh, high stakes poker players in Las Vegas who who invest in each other, right? So you, you can tell the story. They're, they all... That, that one's yeah. really good, too. Yeah, yeah. Planet Money? Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was, yeah. That's a really great story. Um, I wanted to make one more comment, and this is something that, like, like when you first talk about the soccer players getting sold, like, my natural reaction is cringe, right? Like, it sounds like this should be illegal, right? Um, but then, like, right now, I'm getting money from investors who believe that I can make something more than their money, right? And so that's probably legal. That, that's actually, like, considered a good thing. So this, this notion of, um, of when something becomes morally objectable when it comes to ownership is just fascinating. Right. And um, there's another um, far, far, far more radical um, sort of thing going on now with these notions of something called smart contracts. You've probably read a little bit. Um, there's another blockchain project that's called Ethereum. And 
somebody developed a smart contract that basically you put money in and you get a token back, and those tokens are like voting rights. They can't use shares because then you know, SEC will go after them. They get tokens, and um, and then they can vote on which things they're going to invest in. And um, within a period of less than three months, they raised one hundred and fifty million dollars. And this is essentially talking about the DOA. DOA, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. It's essentially. VC fund that is run by source code, and the source code says the rules of how um, that fund is going to invest and what the ownership rights are. So I think that, like, um, as you see, the technology can lower transaction costs, and as you see that transaction costs lower a lot to the point where it's like basically nothing, um, like with the internet data communication, you're going to see like crazy ownership ideas, like crazy stuff where I'm going to sell fractional. Um, uh, take a picture, so every 20 seconds, his camera would take a picture of what he's doing, and you would get the rights for that for the next year, or something like that. So pe people are doing all kinds of just completely wild things with this stuff. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the line between licensing and, and the whole privacy issue, and, and you know, when, when you go into Safeway every day, or you, you or any grocery store, and you use a card, and you exchange information in, ch in, in exchange for a lower price, that's effectively, you're trading, right? I mean, there's a value you've ascribed to giving up your privacy in order for getting that product less at a lower price, right? And my view is that in the, in the long term, that this is eventually going to turn into, it's not, the U.S. legal system has always been about disclosure. As long as we tell you about it and you decide to do it, that's it. That's what terms of use are. That's what all, all these things are, as long as we tell you about it. But, but I have a feeling it's going to become more, the economy of these things is going to become more transparent. So you're going to say, oh, I'll give up my things on Facebook. I'll give you my pictures and I'll give you all this stuff. But you've got to give me something in return for that. You got, there's some benefit that I get in return for that. Maybe that's use of their site or something like that. But but it will be, that there will be some trade relative to that, and that will be disclosed to you in a more apparent fashion. I think. Well, what's, what I think is interesting about that is that as we become more global, the cultural norms in each place are, are dramatically different. So if you think about that calculus and that exchange and that sort of notion, in, in the United States we, we sort of have designed this notion of, well, disclosure and autonomy. So it's a deceptive trade practice to collect your data without your permission if we didn't tell you we were taking it. Um, in um, Europe, uh, there's actually a presumption that the um, employer, in, in France particularly, um, there's a presumption that the employer-employee relationship is inherently coercive and that you as an employee cannot consent to your employer. So they, I, there's actually a hard time building um, uh, internal telephone books uh, for employees because the employers want to get your home phone number to put in like so you can call like in an emergency or something. You can't, we, we don't believe you, you have the capacity to consent. The government is going to say that, that we can do that. Then we go and you look at, say, China. You look at um, Sub-Saharan Africa. You look at, um, you know, uh, Central America. And they all, again, have completely different cultural norms in terms of how we think about data, how we traditionally interact with the legal system, um, who has the power, what does the legal system stand for within that co construct. And so you've got somebody like Facebook or Amazon or somebody else who is sitting trying to make sure that they can harmonize all those norms and it's incredibly um, difficult for all of those entities. Well, I think this is an interesting point on uh, these currencies, these decentralized currencies like Bitcoin, and the fact that the, there are certain legal frameworks and uh, language barriers that are not decentralized. I'm just kind of wondering if you have a perspective on that, Sean, from the technology side. Yeah. Um, so there's very, very few things you can build that will exist only in the virtual world and not um, not be held accountable in the physical world. Right? And so there's a lot of movements to try to um, represent um, law as code and how that works and how that doesn't work. And so um, something like like Bitcoin, for example, you're completely free to exchange um, Bitcoin uh, in the, let's just call it a digital world, 
Um, but the moment you try to go between, say, US dollars and Bitcoin, or yen and Bitcoin, or renminbi and Bitcoin, the moment you try to go between those, um, the government wants you to attach the identity to it. You have to do all sorts of um, uh, uh, regulatory things. And so um, uh, people are experimenting um, in these digital spaces with things that are traditionally based in legal systems, based in regulatory systems. Um, and there's carnage. Like, there's some really great guys in the Bitcoin community who are now in jail. Right? Um, they didn't do the stuff you're supposed to do if you're exchanging value. Right? And um, uh, yeah, like you said, when it, when it goes global, it gets um, even more complicated. Um, countries now, more and more of them are viewing data as um, that's the property of the state. Um, if you want to run uh, some type of service, you have to keep your servers in their country and they have access to all that information. So like whenever I bring my phone, I go to China often, um, it, it heats up a lot. Like they're sucking as much data as they can out of it, right? And, <laughs> and, and, and uh, usually... Some, some companies won't let you take laptops into China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, you know, Yeah, yeah, and, and like, like you can't bring cameras into Samsung in Korea, like there's all of these, um, there's all of these really interesting sort of things that are happening and there's some things you can do with like a digital asset to protect it. Um, you can use encryption, you can store the private keys yourself so nobody can access it. Um, but then there's all of these things like, like how, that, how that collides with the existing legal systems is just fascinating and it's gonna take a long time to sort out. It was really interesting because I was thinking earlier, there are certain actual advantages in art. There are certain advantages to the digital object. And what you were saying, Knut, about, you know, does someone want to have the art in their home? What, how do you handle maintenance responsibilities and insurance around physical objects? And so in certain ways, I mean, I think digital, digital work has some advantages, but it's really interesting that it has this other side, you know, on the, on the physical object art side. It has advantages, but on the government surveillance, taking everything out of your computer side, less, you know, less ideal. Did you want to comment on that, Craig? Um, well, no, I mean, I guess, you know, it, it's, it, again, I think data and, and the norm and, and who it belongs to, I mean, under EU law, it's your data is considered a human right, so just like you can't be tortured, you can't have your, your data taken without your permission. Um, and so it's actually, if, if there is a, um, complaint about, um, that you raise under the European um, data uh, uh, directive, um, it goes through the EU Commission on Human Rights uh, in, you know, in terms of the enforcement, which is sort of bizarre when we think about it in the United States, because um, when we think about copyright and our, uh, you know, like you don't have a copyright interest in, in the photograph that you're in, only the photographer has it, because we tend to sort of basically defer creation or defer ownership to the creator. So we give, whether it's the copyright owner or the data collector or the inventor, that's the person with the rights in the United States. But in, in other countries, we will um, give different parties that are involved um, different rights. Um, if anybody has followed the trek of whether or not the monkey selfie is copyrightable. Um, <laughs> that has actually had spawned lawsuits. Uh, PETA um, just uh, filed a lawsuit um, and was tossed out of court about trying to assert that a monkey had um, uh, had the ability to, to file uh, a copyright uh, on its own behalf. Um, but the Copyright Office weighed in and said under US copyright law that it is not copyrightable. But the original photographer was British, I believe. And so he actually filed copyrights in I believe the EU, but it may have been Australia or New Zealand, and, and they had a different approach to it. And so there are actually different um, um, determinations about whether that monkey selfie is a copyrighted work or not, depending on what jurisdiction is, just because of the way that we sort of approach it. That's fascinating. I mean, I think if you, if you think structurally about, um, if not a selfie, a photo that's being taken by another party, where the party that takes the photo has copyright, and uh, apart from, you know, these kind of rights of publicity, which you know so much more about, um, the person who's having their picture taken has less of a set of rights. But if we if we translate that to the data conversation we're having in the data case, there's an argument to be made that the person who's generating the data is the author of the data and the collector of it. You know, Google or Facebook or whatever who's like taking a snapshot of your data. Um, is, is not the copyright holder. So I, I just find that interestingly no, different, No, no, I think that's, right? that's a really 
really important point, and it's something that I think we're seeing diverge, um, because I think um, as the rest of the world, so, so 15 years ago, we had the US model and we had the European model. Um, well, that European model is now the Canadian model, and it's the Mexican model, and it's the South American model, and it's pretty much every model but the United States that has sort of weighed in on data privacy, as they would call it, um, that, um, that, that has essentially been the model now. manage data. And in terms of the international ownership side, um, do, are there things that are similar that you're seeing kind of play out in different jurisdictions? Well, I mean, I, I you know, uh, in my, I do a lot with Silicon Valley type companies, and I'll tell you, well, my, inter my th perspective on this is that everybody's a data company now. I mean, it, there's just no question. It, you, you may have sold cars. I mean, I represent a company that all they do is, you know, they, they do um, basically leads for used cars, right? If you buy a used car, you're probably using um, a data from my client. But um, they're a data company now. I mean, they, they are about um, the, 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 what, they, what they know about your uh, ability, kind of your thoughts about buying a car is more valuable than the, the fee that they get relative to um, you know, the seller of the automobile. That, that is going to be a, just a huge asset for them. And, and um, it, you know, internationally, it's a much more challenging environment to do those kind of things and to, to kind of get the value of that. But, but frankly, as a consumer, at the end of the day, the more they know about me, about how I buy a car, the cheaper the car gets, frankly. I mean, in a lot of aspects, it, it, um, the, the, their ability to focus on, con on, on the right market and the right niche allows them to more cheaply provide you the car. So that was what goes back to my whole point about there's, there's, there's an economy here, a, a benefit that we get, but we don't, you don't always see what it is. Um, and, and so um, it's not all entirely transparent, I guess is what I would say. And, and one of the things about just a lot of the a lot of these businesses is that it's all about making it seamless, right? It's all about making it just like one button and I've got a car here, and one button and I've got my groceries here, and one button and I've done. And but there are all these things that happen behind the scenes that you've agreed to, or what, whether you know it or not. Um, that that um, so there's this constant pressure between trying to make it as easy as possible, but at the same time you. You're, you are giving up rights, and you are giving up data, and you are giving up um, ownership, I guess is what you would say. Right, and, and I think an argument sometimes, I've heard people make that um, the use of data in marketing and advertising helps people, as you say, buy a car more cheaply um, because there's so much waste in marketing that's not targeted. Sean, were you, were you going to say something earlier? Just I felt like I... No, 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 okay. Yeah, no, so it's really fascinating, and I'm I'm starting to feel like the uh, monkey selfie is a touchstone for the the data questions and ownership questions, and and I think this extends to art quite literally because so much um, digital art art with um, complicated ownership claims is, is often collectively made or social practice art or the record of social practice art, and so I. Um, so what I want to do is I just want to ask you uh, kind of an, one more question and then open it up. I'm hoping there are a number of questions in the room and we can continue this conversation. Um, it's a sort of general question, which is within this world of um, you know, data, ownership, licensing, technology, um, you can take it in either direction or both if you have an answer on both sides of this, you know, depending on, on the mood of how you want to answer this. But, what is the thing that's like most fascinating and stunning and amazing that you see as a possibility at the moment we're in right now? Or what is the thing that really keeps you up at night and is scary about the, the possibility of what could happen in these spaces? So I, I don't know if it, uh, I do think that, uh, the thing that is so cool about all this is, if, if you think back, um, th the whole reason we have contracts is because um, we, that's the only way we're gonna trust one another. So, so in, in 
you know, 200 years ago, you only did business with people who lived in your, your neighborhood. And if, if somebody from who was not from around here came and wanted to exchange value for some good or service, um, you know, you, you had somebody come on, you know, you'd have to have this sort of <coughs> understanding, you'd have communications issues, you'd have uh, questions about equal equivalent value, what is it, the 24 beads that we, that, that Manhattan was purchased for? Um, you know, this sort of question of equivalency of value and how people do that. And, and, you know, and so culture has really defined that for so long. Uh, and the legal system sort of sits on top of those cultural norms. But the thing that's so cool about technology is this ability to create, whether it's through code, tech, making law code, or just um, unifying norms where you can just have these seamless exchanges of value without having to um, complicate things. At the same time, that also is scary because you, you start, start to see how easily it is um, to manipulate um, things because everyone becomes so reliant on technology and they don't have relationships anymore. So I, I can see how that can flip both and, ways. And governance questions too. Sure, absolutely. Governa I mean, governments being based on a, a more literal sense of contract and community. Right, I mean nobody, you know, if Bitcoin becomes the, you know, if you don't have government ma managing the Bitcoin, then, you, you know, then, uh, like what's, or, or is it, or is it the you know Rousseauian social contract where the government is formed by the people and we do that collectively? Right. I mean, I, yeah, yeah. I'm, no, I'm no, no. Asking. I think it's and yeah. it's it's interesting to, to think about whether that's a a, a utopia or a dystopia and and, yeah. and how that sort of implicates all that. Some somebody was reading me a quotation on Instagram the other day that was, "Is the glass half empty or half full? You're missing the point. The glass is refillable." And I don't know if that applies or not, but I, but I mean you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, Sean? Yeah, um, I, I can't resist making uh, one more comment about this data stuff because I think it's um, actually hits at the heart of a lot of um, uh, what it means to be a democracy, right? Um, and I think this is especially relevant now is that um, these companies that have data, they know so much about you and um, it's obvious now that the governments are also getting access to all of this data. Um, and um, I think most people won't argue that information is power, right? Um, you, we, we learn this from a very, very young age. Um, and so this notion of being able to have all of the information, this notion of being able to know um, what's happening, be able to predict behaviors, um, oftentimes better than you even know what your behavior is going to be. Um, there's something deeply disturbing to me about this. Um, I find uh, having that sort of um, information in these centralized places, um, I, I find it just like sort of um, uh, deeply incompatible with what it means to be a democracy where the people are supposed to have the power. And um, the part that I'm interested in is uh, sort of using, using the technologies as tools um, that would allow um, people in this environment that is so global, that is so impersonal, um, to begin to take ownership back, um, take, um, probably ownership is even possibly the wrong word, but just be able to take autonomy back um, over our actions, um, over the things we create, over the things we generate, over the people we talk with. Um, and that's, um, that's really the reason I got into Bitcoin. Um, I was obsessed with it. Uh, money was something to me, it was like the weather, it's gonna rain, what am I gonna do about it? And then somebody comes up and finds a way to make a it's, it's utterly fascinating that we live in a time where all of these things that were once only possible through state, through law, through contract, um, people are coming up with ways that make it work um, using technology. It kind of blows my mind, but it's also very scary at the same time. It can go both ways, yeah. So, um, I'll, from my standpoint, from the kind of the commercial world, I guess, is, you know, I. I view this as, as the time, from an artist's perspective, of, th th there isn't a time in the world where, where content is more driving um, the world in, in terms of economics. The, the barriers of communication, you know, you, you look at what Amazon and Netflix, are. they're in production now. They produce television shows because they need content because they want their people on their, on their um, systems, right? And so great content really drives um, value today in, in ways that are we, we just have never seen before. 
and it, um, uh, you know whether to me finding ways to to maximize the value for the creator those are things that we can we're, we're working on and we're solving whether it's through Bitcoin or um, a blockchain or other met methods whether it's securities um, the like those are things that are conquerable, but right now, in terms of value, I mean, there's just tremendous value placed on content, and I think that makes it a very exciting time for artists. Um, I think that's so interesting, Knut, because I feel like it, this whole conversation about ownership and art is also about ownership, use, and content. I mean, art as as content, and I think you know it's certainly a time in the world where um, you know publishing, magazine publishing, online news content is shifting so much and the way people pay for it or people's willingness to pay for it is in flux. And so I think um, it, it's really interesting to contemplate the ways that technology helps individual creators of content. And also, I remember seeing um, the head of Showtime talk and say that you know they willfully produce all of their own stuff now as opposed to buying it in and the, the ways in which organizations want to be the principal. So, I guess if I had to um, answer my own question, just as in, in the course of opening it up, um, I, I mean this very sincerely. I am very aware that I am on the stage with people who have forms of expertise that I can never have in my lifetime. Like getting to imagine your work with clients, feeling like a third grader some of the time, um, but in an exciting way, uh, trying to understand the, the math behind the blockchain. Um, and I, I wonder how that fits into, and I, I mean this as a nonpartisan comment, um, the current struggle between democracy and the market that we're all living through. Um, the, uh, the market pressure on the media to provide stories and to create news, the market pressure with regard to campaign finance reform, and this this question of how generalists and specialists interact in the world where this specialist content is so incredibly central to how we all how we all live and there's so many specialized things that affect all of us that I don't understand I mean I don't understand how Tylenol works anesthesia um, really the subway I mean um, and I you know I, and some of them get you they fill you with wonder like airplanes fill me with wonder um, but, but I think it's still, you know, kind of what, what's the education consequence? Like, what do, we, what do we need to understand? How do we trust people and institutions and make decisions? Yeah, I, I might reframe that just a little bit because I think it's a really interesting point, which is um, we've never been more than, uh, democratized right now. I mean, access to information, access to uh, technology, um, you know, it used to be that we would talk about a low-budget film as being $5 million. Now we talk about it as 50000 and everybody just goes out. You can get a 1080 camera for $1,100 and go out and shoot a great film. You've got people making hundreds of thousand dollars on lines, right, you know, and, and as YouTube stars and, um, you, know, you, you know, putting shows on Twitch and all these little platforms, and that's just amazing. Um, and, and all of us now are content kind of creators. Um, the flip side is that we don't really have trusted institutions, we don't have content curators in a way that we ever had, and most of the people who are the platforms who are in the position to be curators are completely agnostic. And so how do we collectively think about, you know, how do you manage it? And it makes us more susceptible to demagogues. Right? Edward R. Murrow took down Joe McCarthy um, on a news program because he had so much stature. Can you think of a single person who could do that now and would have that kind of gravitas and stature that whoever, you can your own name, um, <laughs> that might be, um, that you know, would, would challenge somebody, challenge somebody like that and, and make them then have their bubble burst. And I just don't think we have the institutions that are set up to do that, yeah. all because of the and I think you also didn't have a lot of um, authority placed in algorithms. And I, I remember t uh, talking to someone who was telling me about these studies of algorithms, um, like the race of the person who's holding the iPhone and the iPhone in the picture on eBay and ways in which that does or doesn't affect the sales of the phone. And, and the extent to which if, if algorithms are just optimizing for sales, you can end up with socially suboptimal, stereotyping, prejudicial functions. Um, so I, these are really interesting topics, and I, I am very aware that it's a panel about ownership and art, and that we're talking about 
um, politics and society and morality and ethics <laughs> and human experience. It's funny, I, I just... And not about expro for appropriation. Yeah, I'm sorry, appropriation in particular we might sell short right now, but um, it's just funny. I, I, have, I do have a book coming out in July, and I, that's not meant to be a shameless plug. It's called Art Thinking. And, um, <laughs> But um, I just mentioned it because the, uh, the um, indexer put it, there's a category in the index called human experience. And I was like, okay, sure. And there are like 11 <laughs> entries under human experience. Like, all right. But the reason I mentioned that is that I think actually, to me, um, I, I long for a conversation about art that is as general because I think these questions that have to do with um, autonomy, um, originality, creativity, uh, not the extraction of value, but the creation of value and the ability to talk about value in many different forms, um, only some of which are monetary, is really important. And um, I do feel that um, ownership and generosity are, are, are flip sides of the same coin that property rights um, help, help define autonomy and clarity around creative work, whether that's a company that's started by a group of people or a work made by an individual. And so, um, I do kind of have a hopefulness that all of these, these much larger questions are deeply important to the conversation around art, and I know i mean certainly is um, curating and convening conversations about these larger questions of technology and democracy and the human experience. Um, so let me open it up. Are there questions people have in the audience? Yeah, in the back. Yeah, um, so we've been talking about art um, created by people, digital works that are put on my and I just want to sort of move into the future a little and think about, um, like, for example, the divorce, uh, the divorcing of the um, the, 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 the digital um, citizen from the physical citizen, and perhaps the possibility that that digital entity um, starts <coughs> moving towards general AI, for example, and actually starts creating work. Mm -hmm. Can you guys speak about... Yeah, can, can I repeat the question to make sure yeah. it's in the recording and that we all understand it? Um, and flag me if this is not correct. That you're talking about the divorce of the digital and the physical citizen and the particular um, future um, convergence of the digital citizen and questions of artificial intelligence? Yeah, I mean, I, and I don't think that that's far off because like in no. Estonia now, like there's possibility to have your digi digital citizen be removed from the physical citizen, and then what what happens when that then? Right. So we're kind of overlaying these questions we've been talking about, about digital and physical art against um, ownership of the person and the Italian, the soccer star, European soccer star model, and and um, the digital the digital citizen. Let it, yeah. Yeah, I just want to sure. sort of wrap it up. And what happens when that entity um, starts, let's say, creating work um, or that entity, entity starts um, um, flaunting the laws. Um, okay. Can you guys speak yeah. to yeah. that? Yeah. No, no, no. It's, um, it's actually an issue. That the, the monkey self is a great example that, that a lot of people, it, it was quirky and viral, but it was also interesting for um, copyright lawyers because it was exactly um, an indicator of artificial intelligence. And what does what do things look like when artificial intelligence is creating art? And you already have um, computer programs that you can actually download computer programs that are apps on Apple where you can write novels um, using the app. And uh, in fact, there's a lot of, you know, if you read high school baseball scores in your local newspaper, most of those are actually um, written by a, uh, an AI bot that's um, run by a company in North Carolina. Because uh, their uh, earnings uh, reports are often um, written up in, with these. So, so who's the author when you got these AI bots that are that are writing newspaper stories that are published in newspapers that we read? Um, so you're already there. You already have sort of art being created. Um, and there's a real question because if we look at the calculus um, between, say, defamation and how we're going to sort of um, apportion responsibility and allocation under defamation law. Um, how do we think about fair use? Um, the, the whole point of the uh, Article 
one section of the Constitution, which is um, the underlying source of, of copyright and patent law in the United States. It's to further you know, arts and sciences and the development of arts and sciences in the United States. That, that's, a, that's part of our calculus collectively as, as a community. Does the AI experience, does it, does it have the ability to know right and wrong? Does it have the ability to um, um, have incentives created around it? Because a lot of our copyright regime is designed by creating incentives for the artists. Um, to continue to do work. And, and those are all really cutting edge issues that, that people are talking about right now um, without a lot of unclear uh, consequences. Um, I think, and the other thing is that you still have this physical, like, well, there's got to be an author somewhere. Like, is it the writer of the code? Is it the person who hit the button? Is it, you know, and, and those are things that we just, we haven't figured out, but I think that you're right on the cutting edge. I'd like to make one comment because I think this is really neat. Um, so from a technical perspective, um, when I look at this stuff, um, it's even more fascinating because you have the ability to um, to do things in that digital space that cannot be broken into, cannot be cracked or penetrated from the physical space, no matter how strong your computer is. I mean, put aside quantum computing and things like that, right? Like, um, uh, the average person right now in their pocket has encryption that um, the government can't break. All of NSA can't break. And it's in your pocket. And so um, you can say that that artwork in that digital world is yours and you created it and you actually have the autonomy to protect that if you want to. Like you can basically be your own king in that world. Um, and so now how does that, like what does that mean now when you put that in? You're traveling between different jurisdictions. Like when I come into the US they say you can't bring more than $10,000. Okay, well I have Bitcoin and Bitcoin is a number. And I'm bringing a number worth more than ten thousand dollars in the country. What does that do, right? And we're going to carry more and more of these digital things, you know, in our lives that have tremendous value, both, you know, um, monetary and and just you know, purely emotional value. And um, some of those will intersect with the laws of the regular world, and some of those won't. And where you are and what country you're in. So, what is a creation? Um, if an AI makes something, is it is it the person who wrote the AI? Is it the AI's creation? The answer is it's whatever the AI wants it to be. And you can go try to break in, you can try to enforce it, but nothing you can do about it if, if they use encryption. <laughs>
few years ago, uh, online gambling was was like, oh my God, how are you going to do this? Blah, blah blah. But really, technology acted as a forcing mechanism to basically now where you see you can do but the, the online gambling. I mean, is prolific. Well, it's not. There's no way it's stop that. It's uh, the legal system is not effectively eliminated that um, by virtue of that. So, so the technology, the the, the idea. Start and stop. It's not a clean um, transition, but but technology acts as a forcing mechanism relative to breaking down some of these issues, um, whether we like it or not. <laughs> okay. Um,
of tax and oversight. And there are many wonderful works of art that never see the light of day because they just stay there for, you know, in the closet of the report for investment purposes. But I think it represents this idea of um, whether there are marketplaces that are developed outside of government control that are centralized or that are constellations of marketplaces um, or whether a blockchain has that effect. And also, and this uh, kind of stems from something Craig was saying earlier, um, whether there's an ability of um, governments only to regulate at the point there's an actual transaction, where if people are trading in a kind of more ad hoc fashion and it becomes a barter or it's internal to something, it's not, um, the trade isn't settled externally at some point. If, if these are these are avenues that might come up. And you can take it in a different direction if you have. Yeah, well, I'm just going to go back. And, and, yeah. and I, so I think that the interesting thing about your question is, so, so there is the blockchain or something that sits on that, which is more of a self-executing marketplace. And it's one that you sort of set up once. And, and because of the, the infrastructure and mechanism, um, no one really oversees it. Everyone just looks at it and sees the ledger. But there are lots of marketplaces that have a, another platform that have come up, and, and you know it, it's everything from Kickstarter um, or GoFundMe or something like that. Um, but you know you look at something like Etsy, right? I mean, Etsy is this completely um, disaggregated um, set of creators who've all come to a single platform. Now Etsy has to run the platform, but but they have a defined set of of common values and, and often these artist communities are, are built off of that. So it depends on sort of what it is you're looking for. Anything with friction in the marketplace, like if you can create, if there are barriers to entry um, or there's friction, you know, you look at the, the fact that selling organs is illegal. So people had to come up with these concepts for the ways that you're going to do organ exchange because it was illegal um, to, to just pay somebody money. So they had to come up with this other thing. Uh, and, and that's the way that sort of system started to work. So if you're in a context where that commodity either has barriers to entry or friction in the current marketplace, it seems to me that someone can build that um, ultimately Um, yeah, I think if we have time, probably for one more question, um, and, the, uh, and then afterwards, is yeah, and then afterward, we there's there's a refrigerator full of beer, yeah. so <laughs> the uh, you know the um, bourgeois public sphere and the copper moss sense can happen in there. Um, who who does anyone feel like they have a particularly pressing question? <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what I was thinking about that I think is thinking a lot about like um, how can how we license it or think about ownership sort of after its creation. Um, and I think like you brought up this idea of kind of equity ownership, which seems like on one side really exciting in that sometimes like the, the forms of support you need to use certain technologies, which is like pure access, you know, to to resources. Even as you have in like a university space. <laughs> Projects because um, there's not a, a sort of funding mechanism to build yeah. the world only at the end. Yeah. <coughs> I mean, it's. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. Um, so I mean, I guess I mean so so we did have a model.
you know, I think that we're seeing in the tech space, you're starting to see this, um, there, there's a huge um, growth of incubators where you put 10 or 12 innovators in a room and um, they, they, you know, they're the sum of the parts and, uh, you know, a little bit about what this space is all about and because there's this collection, it then attracts people who will then come and collectively um, invest um, by providing legal services or by, Hard, um, yeah. without unless you can have somebody um, who can be a really big mover um, embrace the concept of the of the artwork or of the or of the art place yeah I mean I um, you know my view this is the type of things that really crowdfunding really try to get at right I mean uh, um, and, and the you know the trick to successful crowdfunding is getting that viral thing going right is lighting the fire um, but there are mechanisms for rate you know, to, you know getting a whole heck of a lot of people right together and putting enough money in to kind of fund something like that but it, it, it's it's hard what the hard part is kind of clearing out the noise so to speak I mean there's so much I mean I'm sure that if we started a site that was just about funding large-scale art projects right a platform for that Right? It's still, even, even if we did that and we had millions of uh, people coming to look at that all the time and you had successful project after successful project, still only a limited number of those will actually end up getting funded. But I like the idea of like, um, you know, not just being a monetary thing, like it, whether it's providing legal services for you to do the project or it's um, uh, uh, you know, providing the contractor work to build some of it, or what have you. Uh, it seems to me that again, that the 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 platform model that has been uh, kind of advanced in a lot of different areas is is um, um, it, what is the type of thing that where that works, right? I mean, we, you you can you can fund a um, a large scale art project um, on the internet these days. I mean, I think it's possible for sure. Um, uh, were you more like interested in the funding side, or more interested in like can you actually make this kind of thing side? Like, like which one seems to bother you? I, I think more how it's as such as neither. I guess it's, okay. it's more sort of how um, how you could you know, have some sort of like longevity uh, okay. as okay. a kind of culturally valuable piece of work, right? Like that, that stays within some space of like cultural production in the way okay. that like more historical mediums have. Okay. Like, Okay. Okay. So, um, early on, we thought about how we would make technology that could last for a hundred years, because that's like an oxymoron, basically. And um, some very, very interesting things happened over the past decade um, in cloud computing and all that kind of stuff. And um, the idea is something like a software computer, where you write um, the way that the computer functions instead of using hardware to make it. You actually do it in software. Um, and then that software computer can be, for example, um, an operating system that the only thing that computer does is to run your artwork. Um, and so therefore you have um, code, which as long, so, um, well, uh, basically, um, uh, any general purpose computer can run any program. Right, this, this is this really famous theorem, right? the church Turing theorem. And um, so the idea being that you would create an artwork and you would wrap it in a software computer. It's known as a virtual machine. Um, and as long as that was open source, so you wouldn't want to use anything that was developed in proprietary technology, but as long as that was open source, um, you would be able to have something that as long as we had computers, you could run it. Yeah, so like, that's the way that I would do it. Um, uh, you do take like a performance hit, so um, so if you want to do something like crazy, you know, massive, you might need a lot of computing power to run it now. But Moore's law and all this kind of stuff. Um, so um, I've actually thought a lot about how you develop computer programs that would last forever, because like the worst thing, I mean, go try to run a computer program from 1980s. You can't. Right? It's just a 